Hey team, it's Debbie, the host of the Low Carb Athlete Podcast and the Holistic Method Coaching Program. And I finally have my friend Dina Griffin back on the show today. It's been a long time since Dina's been on my podcast as well. It's been over 10 years. We started this podcast with John Smith, the Fit Fat Fast, and Dina and Bob Sebahor were on the show a few times talking about metabolic efficiency, matching your nutrition and exercise together to figure out the best fueling and training plan. And Dina is now the founder of her own company called New the Nutrition Mechanic. She is a registered dietitian and so educated in the female athletes. So we're going to talk shop with Dina about male versus female athletes, low carb, too low carb, more protein and all that. Cause I know she does some work with Dr. Stacy Sims program. So we're going to get some different opinions. Stay tuned. All right. I've got Dina Griffin on the low carb athlete podcast to talk about nutrition and recovery and repair and everything because she's the nutrition mechanic. Thanks, Debbie. Dina. <laughs> I'm so glad to, to see you, to uh, chat with you. Thank you for having me on. It's so fun always to chat nutrition and sports nutrition with you. It's been so long. You know, I think when we were together at the Nutritional Therapy Association, that was years ago, like four years ago, something. At least, right? It's been a while. I know time, time warps with pandemics and such. I know. <laughs> kind of forget. I know we're just, I was saying that to someone last night that we moved to San Diego from Seattle, June in the middle of COVID uh, 2020. But I feel like we didn't really move here till a year ago because the first six months or whatever, we were just kind of on our own and exploring, but now it's like, oh yeah, we've been here <laughs> That's right. <laughs> a year and a half. So I want to talk about, obviously you've been working with Dr. Stacy Sims. You've done her program and menopausal athletes and kind of what is your direction and focus area based on what you feel like your purpose and mission is for the athlete, or maybe more specifically the female athlete? Yeah, Debbie. I mean, I am a woman, I'm a woman athlete and I'm in my middle age years, I guess. And I don't say that to mean like life is over. It's more this personal drive to, to understand what's happening with the female athlete body, the aging body and how to put all these things together. So I think one of my, you know, relatively newer, although it's been been in the mix for some time, but just this growth of this passion set to really work with, um, you know, women going through perimenopause into postmenopause years, especially us active and athletic women, right? And um, just trying to figure out how to optimize continually. Because I'm just, I'm just, I never was on board with like turning into the decrepit you know, sitting on a chair all day, kind of like aging lady, I want to do everything I can. And so then to share the love, right. With our fellow women, um, and share the love with the men who are supporting women as well. So, and, and all the peoples. So I think in my work in the nutrition scope is in sports nutrition scopes, really trying to go through all of these layers. Um, and, you know, what does it look like for each of us as individuals in our own settings? Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I keep trying to explain to people. It's personalized. It's not, it's, we customize their nutrition, exercise, lifestyle, habit protocol based on, you know, one-on-one -on -one assessment and investigation. Cause I think a lot of people listen to all these podcasts and social media posts, and it becomes this kind of blanket one size fits all approach, but we know that doesn't always work for everyone. So I would say, you know, are you trying to do all the right things? You're not getting desired results. Let's investigate, find out what's actually going on under the hood, but really looking at your nutrition, your exercise, kind of your, your day and look at what does ideal day look like for you to optimize performance. But really, as I keep saying in you as well, look at our aging process, longevity, because I just turned 50 as well. I'm kind of entering that second half of my life where I want to be thriving every day, not struggling when I'm 70, 80, 90 years old as you. <laughs> exactly. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so important to bring to the table and it's almost like a repeated effort, you know, to spread this message that, um, you know, we have differences as individuals, we have differences biologically between men, women, but really ultimately it's still coming back to figuring out, you know, the formula for each of us. So we have to be careful of the generalizations, but we got to start somewhere sometimes, right? So yeah, then, then we filter it down. Yeah. So what do you find the trends out there as we, you know, so-called trends of being people going to extreme carnivore of the zero carb and doing the high protein and organ meats and all that. And then we've got the ketogenic world doing, you know, maybe too low carb and thinking carbs are evil. Then we've got other people just staying with the standard American diet. Where do you find is kind of the ideal areas? I say eat real food that balances your blood sugar and gives you energy and satiety and make you feel good for the next workout. So what, what's kind of your idea of what's feeling of what's going on in our endurance world for nutrition? Well, I still feel like there is massive confusion. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and so sometimes it's just trying to disseminate, okay, where, you know, what, what did you hear? Let's start there. Where did you hear it from? Um, but I think in the endurance community, which is where I spend a lot of my time with clients um, in that realm of endurance sport is still a lot, especially with respect to, to female athletes is still this notion to, um, you know, less is more around workouts that fasted or, and you and I have both been through this in our past, right? Like I can prove to you, I can do a three hour run on zero calories and yay me. Cause that means X, Y, Z. And I think trying to rework some of that shift, the framing around fueling for workouts. So this is one of the areas I still see a lot of confusion. It's not like we know everything either. Um, for every single person, right? Like this blanket recommendation, but I, I feel that and see that, and, and even, even in, you know, working with male athletes, there's still a lot of um, extremes. So it's either way over fueling of workouts or way under fueling of workouts. So sometimes that's just a great place to start, even though we've got the whole rest of the day to work on um, you know, with endurance athletes, we want to figure out how to best fuel. So we, we have to start maybe with the training nutrition, even though ultimately we have to spend, you know, massive amounts of time on the foundational aspects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's a lot of confusion for sure out there of, and becoming, you know, fat phobic before now we're carb phobic and that all, not, all carbs are not evil and where to place those carbs that give you the performance boost that you need. And it can be rocket fuel that, you know, it's not bad. It's processed foods, vegetable oils, sugar. Those are not good for us, but eating the real food that gives you the energy you need, I think is important in teaching people what that looks like. And I think that's gotten confusing to people because it's not a bunch of processed carbs or keto foods that are carbs. It, it's just, you know, finding out people forget what is a carb, what is real food and what do I eat and when do I eat it? Yeah, Debbie, that's, that's right. I mean, I think that is something I've seen too, as another aspect here is confusion around carbohydrates. So there's either the fear and it's, it's also not to say like everyone should be, you know, consuming huge quantities or that it, so this comes back to the personalization, but I think to, to tag on to what you said, it is then working through what are your individual carbohydrate needs? What kind of athlete are you? What are you looking to achieve short and long-term and how do we put and strategize with the carbohydrate load or intake strategies to support what it is we're looking for. And as much as I want everyone to live a long, healthy life, you know, some of us are more um, short-sighted in terms of just wanting to be, you know, the best athlete we can for the next couple of years. And then who cares? <laughs> mm -hmm. So we have to learn the personalities too, along the way. 
Yeah. So we met years ago with Bob Siebel who are doing the metabolic efficiency podcast. And we talked a lot. We were doing the new leaf back then, the testing carts to figure out where is your fat burning numbers, your heart rate to keep imp- increasing your performance or improving your performance and being a fat adapted athlete. So what is your take, you know, 10 years forward where we are now and being do you want people, endurance athletes to be training and fueling to be fat adapted athlete? And do you want them to be showing a little nutritional ketosis, like the 0.5 to one, or what's your take on how do we burn fat as endurance athletes and not get into that blood sugar roller coaster? Cause that's, I think, go back to the roots of where we all started is like, yeah. be fat burner. I mean, I'm still a believer in that metabolic efficiency state, or as you've talked about in your podcast too, the metabolic flexibility or flexible state, or, you know, how that may shift with our um, sport of choice or all the other things. So ultimately I'm still a fan of teaching the body to use its energy stores in, you know, in the right ways for the right conditions. Um, but I think there's still misconceptions that that means, you know, no carbs for you, or, you know, you have to do, um, keto, uh, strictly. So I think this is, you know, maybe that education point and personalization point that, and you've seen this and talked about it a number of times that you can still be a good fat burner. We can still see that through testing, but it doesn't mean that you have to eat, you know, zero carbs or only a few grams of carbohydrates. Um, But there's all those other pieces that we have to look to as well. So are we able to um, train the gut sufficiently to do the competitions we're looking to do and fuel those well, so that training of the body to be a good fat burner may happen at different stages throughout the training year, right? Like in your base training phase. Um, and then putting in those carbohydrates and smart, uh, points throughout a training block throughout in, in those mini cycles or many points of the training block. Um, but also just to meet energy needs. Cause I think that was not what we looked at as closely 10 years ago, at least it was there, but it maybe was kind of in the shadows a little bit. So that risk of going too low on carbohydrate for the sake of being a better fat burner, but then risking some low energy availability state, and then all the health consequences downstream from that. So how do you know if you're too low? What are you looking at to sit, figure out the right macros of protein, fat, carbs for an individual client, are you, how are you testing and measuring and figuring that out? Yeah, probably similar to you in the sense, I mean, use your expertise and your education, your eyes as a practitioner and experience, because we've learned a lot (laughs) from research and from our own stories and from all, all of the athletes we've worked with, but then, um, you know, the diagnostics, right? So whether that's blood work or other measurements that we can bring in to help validate what it is we're seeing. But ideally we're catching this train before it's long gone. Meaning I I don't want to have you be sick before you come work with me. Right. And we have to fix everything. It's trying to catch that stuff early on. So I think this is part of trying to convince people who are interested in health and performance and all of the cool stuff that we have available, like find a practitioner to team up with. And that's, it's kind of like your hair stylist is someone you go to routinely or whatever interval of time, just to check on things. Mm -hmm. Like, here's what I'm doing now. Here's how old I am or how young I am. Here's what's going on health-wise. Is this good? Is this need to be tweaked? Um, so it's this process, right? It's not a single point in time that we just run the systems check and then you're good for 50 years. We got to keep an eye on it. Yeah. That, well, that's what I was trying to do with my personal coaching business is get assess what you're doing now and see if it's working for you or not, and then tweak what we can. And then ideally you meet 
once a month to check in and look at, okay, how did it work last month? How's your training and feeling going this month? What's coming up, you know, and plan ahead. And it's really is finding someone to work with that is a part of that journey and you're transforming and you're learning and you're growing and it's constant experiment. Like I keep trying to figure out with my aura ring, what I'm doing at night, how to maximize my sleep. Yeah. Look at you. You got it on the other finger. Yeah. It's just, you know, such da collecting data and being that data geek. That's like, all right, you know, taking supplements at night, are they making me wake up and go pee more? Or if yeah. I have water or if I have bone broth before bed or right. CBD or, and what works or what not works. All so tweak, you know, got to tweak it, but just kind of see how it feels. And Debbie, that's another point is sometimes we're looking so much at data, right. As the athlete. Yeah. Um, but we forget to actually check in and how, how is it we're actually feeling, feeling like yeah. the touchy feely stuff? Cause that's sometimes we want to ignore it with our type a personalities mm -hmm. or just tough through it, whatever, kind of like, mm, yeah. you know, grunt, grunt through, or don't be a wimp. Come on. And so I think that is harmful. I mean, I've learned that from personal experience too. I think maybe we've all been there yeah. or hopefully we're trying to catch people from going to that point where we ignore some of the signals. Yeah. And on the flip side is we don't always get the signals mm -hmm. until we're, you know, towards, towards some other condition, Yeah. you know, medically or health speaking. Well, that's kind of what my personal purpose is, is what happened to me with my adrenal exhaustion in 2013 is what I kind of transformed my whole business last year since I closed my fitness studio to just focus on helping people that are like me that are, you know, struggling, trying to do all the right things and not getting those results and teach them how to prevent getting to where I got, because there was obviously red flags along the way. It didn't suddenly hit me like a big semi truck one day. There was obviously stuff five years before that I probably had, you know, no clue because I wasn't paying attention and being that stubborn, high performing individual that you know, just push through it more is better. And that's where I see a lot of people starting. I can see it in these groups I'm in. And we have this page I help manage this keto endurance page. And it's like, okay, you guys, you might feel good now, but if you keep doing what you're doing now, six months, a year from now, you're going to feel like crap and your thyroid panel and your numbers, your hormones, everything is going to be a mess. Trust me, <laughs> I've been there. So it's like how to do it right now before you create this metabolic chaos. It's so true, Debbie. And to your point, right? We, we feel good when we make certain changes. So whether that's going to a plant-based, to be keto, whatever thing, a lot of us can feel different and a lot of us can feel better. We think, right. Mm -hmm. And, and that's hard because we're lured by images or other success stories and things without finding out if, first of all, this, this is the right approach or how should it be tweaked? But like, Oh no, I feel good. Or I'm losing some body fat or I have more energy, da, da, da. And so that time frame where we feel like, oh, this is the right thing. You know, I'm doing the right thing. Uh, you know, it could be six months to a couple years before then, you know, those health conditions start to manifest in the blood work or the other things that we would actually measure. So that's what's so tricky about this is this time gap before the things are actually seen and felt to a point where now we are past, you know, like we are getting hit by the semi truck. <laughs> so we, yeah. yeah, all that just to say, you know, there, I suppose the, the summary there is like, mm, we got to be careful and really do some homework. I know this is a message you teach repeatedly. We got to do some homework to figure out if this is the right strategy or how should it be adapted? Yeah investigating that investigating. Yeah. So, you know, going back to the, the exercise and, and nutrition. So fasted exercise is what kind of the more is better. I'm starting to see. And I keep saying every day, my mantra is less is more, as you said earlier, it's like less is more people. And for athletes, endurance athletes, and your niche is more the female athlete, the aging female pre menopausal menopausal athlete, female athlete. What do you find is 
is ideal or not ideal for fueling before or not fueling, like doing a fasted workout or should we have something? Because I'm just trying to dive into research and I know there's some studies, how long to fast for women, no more than like say 12 to 15 hours. And then females should have a little bit carbohydrate, little, maybe it's collagen and some MCT oil and some coffee before they work out, have some calories and then their men are better fasted and then eat afterwards and they all both burn more fat that way. So what have you found in your research and how you practice your nutrition mechanic coaching with fasted exercise for female athletes? Yeah, it's definitely an area to, to be careful around. And so much as, you know, maybe 10 years ago, I did do some generalizations with male and female athletes like, yeah, you know, an hour, two hour, may, you know, maybe a little longer fasted should be fine. So long as it's, you know, you're, you're fueling well afterwards, or it's, you know, maybe in your base season, but I think I have shifted that based on what I see as more successful from a health perspective and training adaptation perspective, Mm -hmm. of course, looking at the little bit of research that is out there on fed versus fasting in the female athlete population, which there isn't a ton of research, but there's enough to show that over time, we're actually going to get more out of what we're seeking, which for a lot of us is you know, maintaining a body composition or trying to achieve a change in body composition or seek, um, you know, gains in strength or speed or just that general fitness adaptation. So I am generally, you know, more of a fan of feeding for female athletes prior to a session. But of course, as you note, uh, in, in the past too, you know, we have to consider what it is we're about to do, uh, consider gut tolerance, consider, um, you know, session dependent, uh, duration intensity, what kind of training block and so on. So I'm a big fan of putting in some calories. I tend not to vote so much for the MCT oil type, or I, I I'll tell you, I see a bit more success, at least with my athletes in, in nailing some protein. Um, and I'm generally more of a fan of an intact or more whole protein, uh, but it doesn't have to be a ton. So we're not talking, you know, 40, 50 grams pre pre training. It might be 10 to 20 grams for those early morning sessions. And then if there is room for a little caffeine or some carbohydrate to come in, that's great. But overall, it's not a whole lot of calories. It doesn't have to be, I should say, but of course it will depend on what it is we're about to do. So do you mean like whole food protein source, but give some examples of what you would eat and then how much, what your timing is before work. Cause I know personally, if I eat something like a, a heavy protein before a workout, it's not going to be digested and I'll be sick. <laughs> so yeah, that's or retasting it. So that's where for my body, again, I'm unique and I have slow digestion. So I, you know, tend to do more liquids and then yeah. like post-workout, I like to do uh, bone broth. So more liquids for me, but what do you suggest before a workout and then how much? So people kind of starting point a template. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think for liquids that definitely is an option. Um, I, I mean, I'm not anti-collagen. I think if we have the right kind of collagen, we're dosing it. I would, I also like to get a bit more on the other amino acids, like the branch chain, which you don't find in the collagen so much. So sometimes it's a combo of some collagen and whey or collagen and some plant, other plant protein for those that don't do whey or other dairy. Um, and it can be mixed with coffee, just like you said. And, you know, that's at least something in a nice mix of the amino acids. And again, it might be you know, 10 to 20 grams total or 25 grams could be more for, um, depending again on that duration. So, and then if we're putting in some carbohydrate in that liquid form, I'm just, you know, I go to the smoothies, Debbie, I'm a huge smoothie fan. And then that affords us the opportunity to blend in maybe a little bit of fruit or some other kind of milk. 
you know, or uh, for throwing in some other plant protein. That's great. And we can double it up then to have it after the session. So we've kind of two for one, but yeah, for some people and that to, to your point about the timing, the liquid nutrition might be, you know, 30 minutes before, maybe it's 90 minutes before. So that's where like, how, what are we putting in this thing? Is there fiber? Is there, you know, do we have to worry about volume of fluid, um, your own gut tolerance and so forth. But for those who can do more solid food, um, and they're not opposed to that, you know, then I might look to, um, something like, I know this sounds not doable for you, but for some, they love chewing food, right? So that could be like mashed boiled eggs with some avocado salted, um, or like sweet potato, egg scramble, that kind of thing to get some of that kind of protein. Otherwise it's like a grain seed protein powder, chewable porridge, which I know that doesn't sound super appealing, but uh, obviously with the solid food, we may have to adjust the timing so that we've got room to either hit the toilet or just get that thing semi-digested. Yeah. Cause I, for me, like we wake up, I make my coffee, do some stretching. I, we work out usually our cardio in the morning about 6am. So I'm not eating solid food then not much time. Yeah. There's no time. So I think it depends on what time of day you work out. So for if sure. I work out, say like yesterday, we went for an hour lunchtime bike ride about one o'clock that I could you know, I needed to time it when I could eat something, because if you're doing a morning workout and then a lunchtime workout, those are doing two days, you kind of have to time where you can eat so you can properly digest it and not have indigestion while you're exercising. Yeah, for <laughs> so sure. Figuring that out. And I'm still a fan Debbie of the, you can kind of oh, yeah. carbohydrate as well. So that's another option. If we are looking to put a little bit of carbon or, or you know, yeah, but Great point. Time of day. Absolutely. That has to be considered in this whole formula. Yeah. Cause I will lift weights some nights at the gym and we go after work about five. So I'm working out at five 30 PM. And so it is timing that too. It's like, all right, you know, I can't eat before workout then I can't eat before bed. <laughs> so that's why yeah. I go, my go-to is kind of a, a cup of bone broth a lot of times to get my protein in because I know it's so essential. So the, you know, what we, why we eat, when we eat, I think is so important and how we eat. So I think a lot of times is timing with their exercise, but also, you know, right after you exercise, you need to let your body recover and shift back into more of that parasympathetic state. So you can properly digest and break down your foods and you're slowing down. And that's why I think liquids might be better for some people that if they eat too close to their workout, you're still in like, ah, you know, the adrenaline going, you're in that sympathetic mode. So just taking some time afterwards. So is there kind of a period of window when you should have your clients eat after the workout is because some people used to the old school was like 30 minutes, have your protein or do you wait? Yeah. For the female athletes, especially the ones who are going through perimenopause, I, I am a big fan Debbie of trying to get in those calories, protein calories specifically sooner than later. I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, mandate like you got to to stop watch on and hit that time or else we failed. Um, But it may, it may be that, you know, 20 some grams of protein, quality protein within 30, 45 minutes, just because in perimenopause, there's so much hormonal flux and we know we more easily lose muscle mass due to those changes in estrogen and the, you know, the ratio of estrogen progesterone can be a little all over the place. And so part of that reason to kind of push the timeline is because we only have so many hours in the day and, and we're also just trying to do everything we can, right. Uh, within reason to work with hormonal shifts that occur. Um, so for those female athletes or those even who are in pre-menopausal years, so maybe they're having natural menstrual cycles, but they're in the high hormone phase, just due to that slightly more catabolic nature of the body, I still might push for that protein sooner than later. Um, 
just to help out what's going on hormonally. And usually that helps with a number of other, you know, side benefits too. Like, oh good, I'm not hangry monster later on, or, you know, if it is a later evening workout, just trying to get some of that um, quality protein more so than to help with the restorative process. Yeah. So what's your favorite smoothie? You said you really like smoothies and having that, what you like your protein source afterwards, mm-hmm. what's your favorites? You mean like my own recipe? Yeah. I know Ooh. you're always sharing stuff on Instagram on your little smoothie recipes and food. I'm kind of a, you know, the late, the lately I, my smoothies, in fact, I have one here, uh, I'll use, um, usually a whey protein is my main source of protein. I'll throw in creatine, uh, about five grams and I'm, I'm testing that out right now. Uh, but I'm a big fan of throwing in some, you can super starch. The, the liquid will vary depending on mood. I kind of mix up all the kinds of milks that are out there. Um, and then I'll throw in some cacao powder just for a little more rich, you know, Yeah, I cannot have enough cacao (laughs) slash chocolate. And then, uh, I, I throw in a small handful of frozen strawberries because I love the chocolate strawberry flavor. I mean, I don't, I think that comes Debbie from childhood and eating a lot of hot fudge sundaes with strawberries. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. I'm trying to think if I'm missing anything in that smoothie, but you can just mix up the amount you need and have some before training and after that's how I do it. You know, it's just easy peasy for me. Do you ever play with adding glutamine or colostrum to your drink, your shakes for I've done, health? Yeah. The glutamine, when I was training a lot for ultras, um, I would definitely do some glutamine, but I have not the colostrum. I have not is that yeah, something just, you're using? Well, I just was actually ordering more stuff from Keon, but I, you know, found it when people are doing longer cardio, you're and especially in hotter weather, you're causing leaky gut basically to your gut and having, you know, supporting your gut health as endurance athlete in your shakes, I think is a great opportunity to throw in some glutamine and or colostrum to help support your gut health, because we think we're being so healthy as athletes because we're exercising, but we're also Interesting. If you look at the research of the leaky gut, how exercise can create that permeable gut wall lining. Yeah. I think exploring those, you know, uh, therapeutic supplements. I mean, I think creatine has some research mm-hmm. now too on gut health and the lining intestinal lining. So I, yeah, I think we have some other aids there that we can sneak into our, our drinks to help mm-hmm. out for those, um, you know, highly stressful, uh, gut stress situations. Yeah. So going back to the protein, what do you suggest is like 0.55 grams of protein to 0.8 or up to 0.8 to 1.0 for the female athlete, where's your guidelines. And then we hear 20 to 30 grams is all you can absorb at once and spacing that out throughout the day, which I'll add in before I give it back to you. Intermittent fasting, and having that eating window of eight hours, it doesn't work to get in your <laughs> protein. So I think it kind of shows that we need to expand that eating window. So what's your yeah. take on the protein and timing yeah. that part? So my take or my preferred approach is for female athletes. And again, there's some variants here we have to work with, but I'd say 0.7 to 0.8 grams per pound is maybe for general female athlete population, maybe all the athletes, you know, I might put in that realm. I I do, I am a big protein fan. Uh, And then for perimenopause for masters athletes, or, you know, the aging athletes to work with some of those um, age related, you know, uh, difficulties that we might have with holding onto muscle or building muscle or ultra athletes, I'll go as high as maybe a gram per pound of body weight and yeah, trying to distribute, distribute throughout the day is definitely a goal. I, you know, I'm not a huge proponent of strict eight hour eating windows for the majority of my athletes, but if we're working on 
preventing diabetes, you know, if we've got some other metabolic syndrome and we're not a highly um, competitive athlete with a huge training load, I might look to shorten some of that eating window. Um, it might not always be eight. I'm somewhat fluid in that recommendation. Um, but important to spread out whatever it is we come up with your total protein goal, at, at least for women, I do like to see that distribution um, as evenly as we can throughout our eating time. So when you're figuring out someone's nutrition plan, their macros, because everyone's into figure out their macros versus calories, figure out that you start with protein, then kind of split up the fat and the carbs, or how do you kind of divide it up? If it's like a 40, 30, 30, or what do you find as a starting point and then tweak and adjust course? Correct. Yeah, that's a good one, Debbie. I do, you know, if I'm doing the planning and trying to set up what the kind of the baseline or the template looks like, I will start with protein most often, like, cause that's so fundamental and so mm -hmm. core, and it can be a challenge for athletes thinking about protein. Cause a lot of folks are worried about carbs or fat and we forget where's protein come in, you know, mm -hmm. um, or just not realizing we need more than, than probably what we're getting. So I'll start with that. I, I like to think in more absolute instead of per percentages, mm -hmm. uh, just because the percentage goals, you know, you can eat 1200 calories and still be at, you know, 30% protein, but I, so, but if I told you to do X number of grams of X, Y, Z, then that ensures we're getting in enough energy to meet your needs. So I'll often start with the absolute, you know, that gram per, you know, I'll do my number crunching and then translate it to foods and then adjust the carb fat based on the kind of athlete based on their goals, where we are time, time-wise life cycle stage, uh, you know, all those considerations. So if someone's goal is fat loss versus performance gains versus longevity, how would you adjust your uh, nutrition plan or goals for them at starting point? Is there a difference for fat loss goal? Yeah, I would, I definitely would put up that protein, you know, in, in that high range, maybe even higher than what we said, a gram per pound, it might be slightly higher. Um, and, and of course we haven't mentioned quality, right? Yeah. Cause there's all kinds of proteins, all kinds of carbs and fats. Uh, so that has to be mixed into this whole picture. What are the sources that we're looking at? Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I, I don't go these days, Uber, Uber low carb, right. It, it is that moderate range, which I know is so vague, right. What is moderate? So, I mean, it could be hundred grams of carbohydrate. It could be 250. It, it kind of depends on the energy needs of the individual and what kind of training they're doing. Uh, other factors, of course, but I, I will often then look at where those carbs come from, right? As you, as you talk about Debbie, so often, you know, the quality makes a difference when we're talking about blood sugar control or kind of feeding cravings, we're trying to stave off cravings um, and taking care of our guts mm -hmm. too. So we need those whole foods, a lot of vegetables, um, maybe some starchy veg in there or some root veg, things like that. Uh, then there might be a time and a place for throwing in some grains too. We have to consider vegan athletes and what, you know, their preferences are uh, protein, carb, fat wise. And what else to that story? Oh, fat. Yeah. I may for, uh, you know, peri postmenopause, I think you know, there's a little bit of research just showing and, and knowing our heart disease risk goes up so much. I kind of play with that fat amount and tend to see more benefit if it's not extremely high, you know, where we are doing like 60, 70% of our calories from fat. I take that way down. Yeah, that's good. I think you know, a big thing is talking about the female aging athlete and as their hormones change, what do you find are the, the big top three tips, the fe aging female athlete as they enter their fifties and we're still training, maybe racing or not, but their 
hormones are changing and they're trying to avoid that stereotypical weight gain that you're going to have happen when you reach menopause and night sweats and all that crap you hear about. <laughs> what are your yeah. top tips for the aging female athlete to make it the best part? I think shifting shifting or giving an eye to your protein has to be in the top three, Debbie. I mean, I just see more, so much more success when that is on the radar. So what that means usually is increasing protein, but like we just talked about making sure it's spread out and looking at the quality of the proteins. Um, but there's, there's so many more, there's so many benefits to looking at protein and, and getting in adequate or optimal amounts of protein so that I almost hundred percent of the time will, would put in my top three. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I shouldn't say almost a hundred because that doesn't make sense. Always a hundred percent. Um, and then also looking at properly fueling workouts. So not being shy to actually try to put in some fueling around workouts. It, again, it doesn't mean a ton. It doesn't mean we're living off energy gels. You know, there's a lot of options for fueling, but thinking of the potential then gain that we get from actually putting that energy towards the training session we're doing and how that can affect recovery and the long-term adaptations we're seeking. So fueling around workouts is another one, not being shy about that. And I think another one, nutritionally speaking, is just looking at that carbohydrate source. And really, as we age, you know, we're just, we can't quite eat the same for most of us as we did when we were in our 20s, you know, like anything goes kind of thing. So it is trying to shift away from a lot of the ultra processed carbohydrates and find joy and pleasure and, you know, getting our energy needs from those, those array of other more whole food, less processed carbohydrates and timing them well. Yeah, for sure. So I think a lot of people have that fear of being kicked out of fat burning, as I said, and they just afraid to have, you know, those carbs. So you, do you want people to have metabolic flexibility so they can flip that switch back to out of fat burning to carbs and then back to fat? You know, I think that's the biggest fear of why people are so afraid now of having any carbs once they become fat adapted athlete. Now they're like, okay, I can't have any carbs because that's going to throw me out of my fat burning and ketosis. And then I'm going to be burning sugar, not carbs. So what do you, what would your response be to that person going, okay, what do I do? I know. Well, I think that's where, you know, making sure your training programming is set up properly. Because I, I, and you've talked about this too, and you know this from all the training and coaching you've done, like we have to change the way in which we train as we age. I mean, maybe that should be started much sooner with that ex exploration, but like the long, slow distance, we certainly get benefits from, you know, the fat burning realm, but also, are you sure that you're in that fat burning zone? Because you know, so many of us think that we're not getting in a good workout if we're not sweating or our heart rates not high enough. Um, but then we're defeating the purpose if we're in that middle zone. Um, so, you know, and then like strength work and the high intensity stuff. I mean, so many are afraid to do hard, hard work because it hurts, <laughs> but it's all part of this metabolic, um, you know, flexibility story. But nutritionally, I think if we're looking at carbohydrates, again, it's the kind of carbohydrate, the quality of those, putting them post-workout when the body's more insulin sensitive, and then looking at amounts, that plays into this story as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think post-exercise is great, or you know, maybe it is to fuel the workout for, for longer or harder sessions. Yeah. Um, that's key. Yeah. So I think we I probably answer, we're talking about the same answer for different questions because <laughs> it yeah. comes back to, you know, eat more protein. It's always, I find like the Goldilocks effect, less is more and change things up. Don't do the same thing all the time. Don't do the same training routine, your strength training routine, your cardio routine. 
your food routine, your fasting, you know, mix things up is going to give you that big, biggest bang for the buck kind of thing that you're going to get more results. If you switch it up and have those variations in everything we do. Seems yes. Possible. Knowing how to do that. And for us women knowing it probably will look different from what your male counterparts are doing. Yeah. I know. Like I work out with Neil all the time. We're kind of like, we do, we're sad. We, we do our bike and our runs together and our lifting weights together and we eat together. It's like, yeah. you know, how come you're getting all these strength gains over me? And then how come, you know, he can recover so much faster. Like we ran Hills today and I had to walk run because my legs retired from yesterday. I'm like, Why are you fine? So you can't compare yourself to your husband or your male training partners <laughs> when you're That's so true. Uh, and you can't blame the aging process. That's my other uh, big pet peeve. Just it is Oh yeah. Is. Like I'm getting old. I can't do that. Yeah. yeah. We have to mm, not acceptable. No, not at all. So the last bit you have a new podcast out. You've gone back to working with uh, Bob Sibahor. We talked to him years ago when we all were doing that metabolic efficiency specialist training and his books. And you guys, you were doing metabolic testing. Now you're, you've got your nutrition mechanic. What's the, the mission for this new podcast you guys are doing? Oh, the new pod inside sports nutrition, Debbie, we are teaming up or we have teamed up just to talk all kinds of things, sports nutrition. So we're looking at, um, not only endurance athletes, but also team sport athletes, uh, you know, aesthetic sports, all trying to encompass more than just that endurance community, but how does nutrition play into fueling the athlete and also addressing across the spectrum from youth to, you know, uh, adult to, to master's athlete changes and considerations along that spectrum. And then of course, different abilities, but looking at translating the research to more practical findings, like what does this, you know, latest study tell us, or how do we employ these strategies, um, supplements? I mean, the, the works, but mostly that sports nutrition focus, and featuring some guests along the way to, you know, hear fun stories. Yeah, that's great. It's fun podcasting. I mean, I was suddenly, it's been 10 years since, or 11, wait, 10, yeah, it's almost 11 years since we started this. And I just, I always find it, it's fun to, it's, it's like, I would say, I don't care if anyone listens or not. Ideally, yes, I want lots of listeners, <laughs> subscribers and downloads, <laughs> but I just love talking to people like you and having these guests because you connect with people that are like-minded or maybe not like-minded and just have great conversations. And I think that's the reward personally for me is, is interviewing and having guests on the show to just dive into fun topics. Fun topics. And, you know, if we can turn someone's light bulb on to try something new or learn something new, geez, yeah. that is worth it. Even, yeah, even if they're only, you know handful of listeners. That's okay. If we make, if we have fun along the way and help someone learn, then that's super. Yeah. Well, I think podcasting especially has grown. I don't know how many hundred more thousand podcasts out there since we started back in 2011, but I think it's, it is a great platform to share research and your thoughts and, you know, open up conversations is fast and good for athletes is yeah. carbs, protein, fat for women and the menopause, and, and just explore these different topics on a podcast platform versus writing it in a blog or social media. I think this is a great way to talk about it and share our passion, purpose, and why and mission to follow that. For sure. Yeah. I love that you've been in this, like you're one of the beginners here, like doing podcasting and talking about, you know, fueling the athlete in various ways and showing mm -hmm. that journey that you've been on personally. Yeah. And it's evolved. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. It keeps on evolving. It does. So where can people find you? Let's give your links. I'll put everything in the show notes to so make sure people look below in the show notes to get more of Dina's information, but just give your social media and your website. Oh, thanks, Debbie. Uh, nutritionmechanic.com is the website and Instagram is nutrition mechanic. Those are my two, you know, go-tos I'm on Facebook, but it's, you know, not as, uh, heavily, you know, used as maybe Instagram. So 
uh, yeah, that's, those are my finds. Those are my spots. Are you speaking at any conferences in 2022? Oh gosh. Uh, not any officially on the schedule. Good. Well, let us know. And we'll share that on the Facebook page and the Instagram page. So we're the low carb athlete on Instagram and Facebook. And again, I'm same thing. I'm more Instagram than Facebook and just forward everything <laughs> to Facebook. Yep. Less is more again, less social media, the better. And no, <laughs> no, 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 no notifications on my iPad or iPhone. I actually don't even have Facebook on those devices and I only use it on my computer. So those are having Amazing. all these alerts and notifications, turn them off. I hate them. They're so bad for us. Good on you, <laughs> Debbie. Yeah, I have Good no, like you. if there's something on there, I have to look it up on Facebook. So on my computer, but anyways, we have our keto endurance group. You guys can check out that Stephanie Holbrook started. I'm kind of helping her manage that. So if people want to join our private group page, I put research and more information on kind of the holistic method that it's more about stress management and movement and strength training. And it's not just, I hate the word keto. So <laughs> just, just the branding of things, but it's just don't label what, how you eat. Just it, we could call it the real food athlete. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah. So thanks Dina for coming on the show and we'll all listen to your podcast and learn some new things with you and Bob. Well, thanks, Debbie. It's been a pleasure as always and appreciate having some time with you and talking nutrition. Thank you. Great.